some subjects you know well. In Murray Gelman's case, physics. In mine, show business. You read the article and see the journalist has absolutely no understanding of either the facts or the issues. Often the article is so wrong, it actually presents the story backwards, reversing cause and effect. I call these the wet streets cause rain stories. Papers full of them. In any case, you read with exasperation or amusement the multiple errors in the story and then turn the page to national or international affairs and read with renewed interest as if the rest of the newspaper was somehow more accurate about far off Palestine than it was about the story you just read. You turn the page, you forget what you know. This is the Gelman amnesia effect. I point out it does not operate in other arenas of life. In ordinary life, if somebody consistently exaggerates or lies to you, you soon discount everything they say. In court, there is a legal doctrine of falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus, which means untruthful in one part, untruthful in all. But when it comes to the media, we believe, against evidence, that it is probably worth our time to read other parts of the paper, when in fact it almost certainly isn't. The only possible explanation for our behaviour is amnesia. And we've, we've seen this, we've seen this played out in recent years. What struck me the most was the... Uh, 2016 US presidential election, and we were assured that they were absolutely certain of the outcome for so long. In fact, the Newsweek magazine printed hundreds of thousands of copies with Hillary Clinton's smiling face on the front, and into the pages you could read about how she was always going to win, and smug little articles about how they knew all along. And of course, the day after, it had to be pulped, and they had to make a new, a new magazine about Donald Trump explaining how they knew that, of course, he was going to win. And you may be aware that uh, in the USA, the uh, media, 95% of it, is owned by just six large corporations. In the Netherlands, three companies own all of the newspapers. Left-wing, right-wing newspapers are owned by just three Belgian companies. So if you've ever wondered about why there's so many true waffle stories in the Dutch press, that's why. <laughs> but what's, what's the solution to this? My traditional solution to this would be to take the newspaper and send it spinning across the room into the trash bin. But one day I thought, what if I can do something different? What if I can do something to encourage people to think, to question, to discuss, to look at the world in a different way? And I came up with this idea which I call Smash the Narrative. And it's a project to do that. So I had this idea, uh, but I needed a medium. And so I came up with art. And the thing about art, there's something very special about it. There's something visceral about it, something direct. When you, you can go to an art gallery and you can engage with a piece of art in a way that kind of cuts through the layers of propaganda that, that pervade every other type of media. And of course, every artist has their own agenda. They have their own biases, their own narrative. But each one is individual. No one is telling the artist what to do. You can go and you can look at all the different arts in this exhibition, we put together all sorts of different opinions, and we're not forcing you to go round, down one track. You can look at each one, and you can, you can make up your own mind. And the other nice thing about doing uh, art is if you have an art prize, it encourages artists to create art, which I think <coughs> is an end in itself. I mean, a lot of the pieces that you see here were created specifically uh, for the prize, and actually there are many artists who we didn't have space for here who also created works inspired by this thing. And the other nice thing about the art prize is that we automatically get this. We get to have the exhibition where it can engage with the public. So I had this idea. I was going to make an art prize to challenge people. And then I had to come up with a theme. And the theme I chose was nationality. What does nationality mean in the modern world? How is it changing? What's the alternative interpretation of it? This is called alternation. And obviously, this is a very hot issue at the moment. There's a lot of, you can read about it a lot in the news. It's something people talk about a lot. But I also wanted it for my own education, because it's something that I find very hard to understand. I, I personally lack, or seem to lack, the tribal instinct that so many people have. 
I am completely uninterested in the English football team, whether they win, whether they lose, whether they play at all. I certainly won't be brought to tears by the result. I don't feel an uncontrollable urge to get people to try jellied eels or any other type of British delicacy that I should treasure because I'm from there. Um, and also I find other people's opinions sometimes very confusing. I've heard people tell me that the borders in Europe are imaginary and absurd lines. People should be able to live wherever they want. No human being is illegal. But then these same people the next day have told me that the 1967 borders of Palestine are completely sacrosanct and all the illegal Jewish settlers should be cast out and their homes destroyed. So it's a very uh, interesting issue and it's also what made it powerful is that it's so personal to so many people and it really got a lot of artists really excited and really uh, ready to create works. So once we uh, came up with this idea, I needed to find a gallery. Now this was pretty interesting because this is my first foray into the world of art. So I had a lot of help from Julia, who's been great, but we, we were phoning up galleries and they'd say, well sorry, we don't normally take outside exhibitions. Um, have you ever done an exhibition before? No? <laughs> uh, do you know anything about art? No? Uh, what pieces are you going to put in the exhibition? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> but luckily there was one gallery who was just crazy enough to take us on. So I'm really grateful that I was going through. And um, but hopefully it's, it's paid off for them. Yes. <laughs> so we had, yes, as we had over 100 entries from around the world. Some of these pieces you see came here in big, huge wooden shipping containers. Many of the artists who are standing in the audience have flown in from all over the place. Uh, we have stuff from Indonesia, Bulgaria, Hungary. Um, almost have something from America, but it's stuck in customs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as, as I started to look at these pieces, some kind of uh, themes emerge. One interesting thing is that naturally, the, uh, a lot of people feel in Europe that the, idea, the traditional idea of nationality is under threat or is changing in some way. Uh, and a lot of Dutch artists, for them, this is centered around the issue of refugees and Islamic immigration. And they feel concerned that um, such immigrants would feel unwelcome or alienated by, the, uh, by not being part of Dutch society. Whereas, uh, in contrast, uh, a lot of the Eastern Europeans are very proud of their nationality, proud of their religious heritage, and it's something that they want to preserve at all costs. And we saw this recently uh, played out on the world stage when the uh, EU was trying to punish Hungary for its recent uh, anti-immigration policies. So, uh, the other thing is that some people have gone, found it very personal. It's, nationality for them is about home, it's about sense of belonging, and perhaps having to leave that home. Whereas others went very optimistically uh, looking at the whole world in a very abstract way and saying that uh, different cultures, while well, different, could live side by side in harmony. But all this has made it very, very difficult to decide on the winner. We had some things which were of uh, incredible technical quality, but they didn't really fit the theme well enough. And then you have things that are vice versa. There's so many different uh, factors to take into account. But I'm ready now to uh, announce the winners. <laughs> In second place is Zoran Georgiev's Flying Saucer. <laughs> Tradition. He's got this beautiful traditional bow, and then he's combined it with modern technology and created something which is quite alien, quite literally a flying saucer. So I think it's very uh, thought-provoking. How, do, how does the modern world actually create something that used to be turn something that used to be traditional and, and, and solid into something that's weird and, and outlandish? Well, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations.
And the first place prize will go to Daria Turina, Art Unite. And it's made me um, think about things in a lot of different ways. You can look at the, the art, the way that it's being lifted up. The, the war is underneath us. Is it separating people or is it kind of a necessary foundation? Mm -hmm. and I think it's just a really beautiful object and a very original and creative piece of sculpture. Thank you yes. very much. <laughs> Decide on that's going to be the audience choice award. So there's some um, little here, these little slips of paper will be handed out, and you can tick the box of your preferred artist. And um, at the end of the month, they they will receive the, the third prize for the audience choice. Thank you very much. Yeah.